Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come to you as a, a, a body of believers today, a people within your church who have a whole variety of circumstances around us. Some of us walking through some really, really great things and exciting and fortunate parts of our life. Others dealing in heavy pain, difficult problems, tough circumstances. No matter what that might be, the movement of our heart, the, the bittersweet nature of this life, the, uh, as, as the Bible describes it, the sorrowful yet always rejoicing reality of this world we live in. We just ask that your spirit would move in some really powerful ways today. That, that among all of those circumstances, we would watch and, and really grasp the truth that you are above them all, beyond them all, and orchestrating all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And uh, so we just, we just ask that you would guide us, lead us in that truth today. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to... I want to begin today with a rhetorical question. That means don't answer. I'm just asking uh, for you to contemplate and think about this uh, because I think this is really the centerpiece of our text today. It is it's this. What is your biggest problem? What is your biggest problem? Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm married, so I get that what's your problem question all the time, but it's in a different context than that, right? Uh, just kidding. My wife's in the nursery. I can't make jokes about her today. Uh, what is your biggest problem? I, I think the reality is in the circumstances of our lives, we're all dealing with some different things, different realities, different difficulties, and we might answer that question differently, but the appeal of Mark early on in his gospel and the call of Jesus is going to bring us to one centralized answer in the way that he interacts with the people around him. You see, um, we started two weeks ago this new series. If you're new here, uh, what we tend to do is we tend to teach through series or long week over week over week over week passages throughout a book of the Bible. We find that that helps us kind of keep our mind in the same setting or the same track as the weeks go on. And we began this series in what's known as the gospel according to Mark. Now, God Gospel means good news, and it's actually not the gospel of Mark, it's the gospel of Jesus, the good news of who Jesus is, and it's told by an author by the name of Mark, who had uh, witnessed from Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus, what Jesus did in his ministry, and then goes to record it and write it down. And so the beginning of this, a couple weeks ago, we started with some kind of overarching concepts, and we said, in particular, the Gospel of Mark uh, doesn't sort of tell the story the way that many of us would tell a story. We, we tend to kind of, in our culture, follow chronology as we tell stories, right? Like, we want to talk about what happened at a young age, and then uh, from their next few years to the next few years to the next event in order of time. Mark isn't so interested in the timing of things as much as he's interested in establishing this sort of, and the illustration we use was a roller coaster feel, right? That the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, the first eight chapters in fact, in fact if you write in your Bibles, uh, you could write this at the very beginning of chapter one, that the first eight chapters of what Mark is doing is establishing the identity of Jesus. We said it's going to really kind of ascend and ascend and ascend and ascend up the tracks of a roller coaster into Jesus his identity, and each continuous part of this ascent gets more and more kind of exciting to the crowds that are around him. It begins to grow a greater and greater following, except that at the end of Mark chapter 8 and the beginning of Mark chapter 9, the bottom falls out of everything for the followers of Jesus. You see, they were looking for a Messiah who was really going to solve their everyday problems, except Jesus, upon 
being told by his disciples that he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, they finally get it, responds at the end of Mark chapter 8 and into Mark chapter 9 with the mission that he ultimately came for, which was not to deliver them from their everyday problems, but it was to die on a cross. And for the disciples who were expecting something quite different than that, there is a sudden change. It's like you went over the top of that roller coaster and you're pretty sure you're falling to your death, right? And and then Mark chapter 9 through Mark chapter 14 follows this mission of Jesus and it really begins to unfold. This is what Jesus came to do until finally in Mark chapter 15, to the end of the account is the actual salvation offered in Jesus. Jesus on the cross who is the one who has come to save. And so we said we'll follow this through his identity to his mission to the salvation offered in him and said really what Mark's going to do early on over the next several weeks is establish the authority of Jesus, the jurisdiction of Jesus. He's the one who is in charge. And so here's how we pick up. Starting in Mark chapter 1, verse 34, we see the first time that we'll see several times throughout the next chapter, and if you're reading along at home, you'll watch this again and again and again, and it leads to a real interesting question. In Mark 1, verse 34, it says, Jesus healed many who were ill with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, and he was not permitting the demons to speak Because they knew who he was. Now that's a curious thing, right? If they knew who he was, wouldn't it add to his authority to let them testify to who he was? In fact, it's not just the demons. Frequently, Jesus, we're going to find over the next few chapters, heals people, solves somebody's problems, does things for people, and consistently over the first eight chapters, upon doing this, he looks at those people and says, don't tell anyone. That seem a little weird to you? It should. I think the question becomes, why is Jesus hiding his identity? Right? In fact, if you're a Christian, you've been in churches uh, for a long time. In fact, if you've been here for any length of time, you know that one of the primary missions, one of the primary objectives of a Christian is to tell people about Jesus. Go! Proclaim him. And so Jesus upon doing work that would testify to who he is, goes, hey, keep this between us. Don't tell anyone. Well, what's the reason? Why is Jesus hiding his identity? There's, there's two reasons primarily. Here's the first. It shows up in the very next set of verses. Go with me in verse 35 and watch what happens. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place. He was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, Everyone's looking for you. And Jesus said to them, Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into the synagogues all throughout Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Here's the first reason he tells people not to tell anyone early on in this message is because Jesus wants to preach the gospel to all people. And very quickly, every time Jesus heals, every time Jesus casts out a demon, every time Jesus works a miracle, it begins to draw a larger and larger crowd. So much so that we're still in chapter 1, and Simon, his disciple, newly found disciple, goes, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. Why are you out here in this secluded place by yourself? All the people want to see what you're going to do next. And Jesus goes, no, 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 that's not what I came for. What I came for was to tell them the truth. Well, because remember the question, what is your biggest problem? Jesus came to answer that question. And the reality is the crowds were interested in smaller problems than that. In fact, let's, let's watch. If you skip ahead to chapter 2, watch how this starts to play itself out. When Jesus had come back to Capernaum, Several days afterwards, he, it was heard that he was at home. Now, despite the fact that Jesus has done this work to say, hey, relax, 
Don't tell everybody about the healing work that I've done. Make it so that I can actually preach and actually proclaim the gospel. This hasn't happened at all. In fact, the verses in between, Jesus heals a man who is sick with leprosy, says don't tell anyone. He goes and tells someone so much so that in verse 45, very end of chapter 1, it says when the man went out and began to proclaim it freely and the news spread around to such an extent, Jesus couldn't publicly enter a city, but he stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. Didn't matter. Now there was no secluded place. Even as Jesus is out somewhere else, the crowds have followed him to these places. Well, he travels back to the town of Capernaum. That's where Peter and Andrew, his brother, are from. He enters in and it's heard that he was at home. And it says, many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Now, the Bible says next that they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. So let me, let me kind of set up this situation for you. Jesus has now returned to Capernaum. It says he's at a home. Uh, the home is most likely the home of Peter, Simon Peter, and Andrew, his brother, uh, we know that early on in chapter 1 where we kind of skipped through, there's an interaction where his mother, Peter's mother, is sick. Jesus heals her, gets her up, and she starts working in the house, and they're staying in that house. And so now Jesus is back there, and they begin to teach, so much so that the house is packed crammed full. Everyone is there. Everyone wants to hear. Everyone wants to know what's happening next. So much so that you can't possibly get in. Tickets are sold out and then some. Fire code issues. People are packed. And so what happens is somebody shows up. A paralytic. A guy who cannot walk. Who happens to have four friends. Who really truly believe that if they could just get their friend in front of Jesus... Jesus could heal this guy. After all, that's what we've been hearing. He is casting out demons. He is healing people. He is fixing the big issues in people's lives. And so they decide, well, we're going to figure something out. And so they climb up on the second floor of the house. They do some quick math. They kind of peek in the windows and figure out about where Jesus is. And they begin to tear apart the roof, right? Like, yeah, I mean, you imagine what, like, an exciting scene this is for everybody except for Peter and Andrew, right? Like, it's their house, right? Like, what are they doing? Come on, man. Like, call your homeowner's insurance, right? Like, what is going on with this? And, and then as they rip all of this thatch out of the roof and create a hole big enough, they begin to lower down this man onto his pallet, like, in front of Jesus. Now, let me just ask you this. What do they expect to happen next? Not rhetorical. Just get, what do they think is about to happen next? Guy can't walk. Drop him down in front of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. We better not be carrying this chump home. <laughs> I mean, listen, this is a one-way trip for us as friends. Amen? Remember the question? What's your biggest problem? What's your biggest problem? Verse 5, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. You see, your biggest problem, my biggest problem, our biggest problem, is that we are a sinner in need of forgiveness. Your biggest problem, despite what you might have thought at the beginning of this, the things that might have popped up in your head, it's not your circumstances. It's not your job. It's not your kids. It's not your spouse. It's not your parents or your finances. It's not your time management. It's not your boss. Your biggest problem, bigger than all of those, Bigger than all of those realities, Jesus is going to point out right to this man. The biggest problem is we are sinners in need of forgiveness. Now, we might agree with that 
on the surface, especially if you're, if you're not a guest here with us, if you're regular, uh, you might hear that and think that that's a pretty reasonable and, and normal statement to be made in a church like this. However, at the time, like, I, I need you to hear this, it's an outrageous thing for Jesus to say. In fact, I think if we were to really unpeel this a little bit more, we would understand how outrageous it is even in our culture today. Let me, I'll tell you a story to try to help with this. Um, I, got, I got out of college, and shortly after that I got married, and, and Whitney and I were married for a few years before we had kids. And not only were we married for a couple years before we had kids, uh, but I worked in finance during that time, uh, which means that between having a good job and no kids, I had all this money. It's all gone now, but it was there at the time, right? Amen? So some of you, you have kids, you know, you know. But at the time, I was like, man, I don't know, I should, I should find something fun to do with this. I was a huge sports fan, and so uh, in 2009, I bought season tickets to the Detroit Tigers. That was back when they were good. They had Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer and Miguel Cabrera and didn't win the World Series. It's just, it's, man, I'm still angry. But... I specifically remember, uh, and even when I had money, I was still cheap, uh, I would sell my ticket to opening day because it would pay for several other tickets during that year because it was always packed. And then the second game of the year, early April, went to Tiger Stadium. My, my seats were in the outfield uh, and, and where Comerica Park is what it was. Maybe it's not even called that now. I don't know. But uh, the, the left field had the bullpen, and then beyond the bullpen were like scores of seats, and I was about nine rows back beyond the bullpen. And so they were, they were a little bit cheaper seats. I really liked it because I could watch the pitchers warm up, and if somebody really jacked a homer, you, you might have a chance. I never caught one, but you might have a chance. But the reason I know that is because I remember I went to the second game of the year. We were playing against the Boston Red Sox, and they had a guy pitching who threw the last, last one in the major leagues, a knuckleball. You guys know what a knuckleball is? Right? It's a ball. Normally, when people throw a baseball, they throw as hard as they can, and it spins a lot so that it would move in a certain direction. A knuckleball is you throw it so that it does not spin at all, and what happens is the air, because the ball isn't spinning, moves the ball into directions that are really unpredictable. And so a good knuckleballer can throw a pitch 60 miles an hour when everybody else is throwing 100, and it makes people swing and miss all the time because you have no idea what the ball is about to do. So they had this knuckleballer named Tim Wakefield. And what I specifically remember is it was not his day. You know, that's the thing about a knuckleball. When it's working, it's great. When it's not, that game, the Detroit Tigers set a record. They hit eight home runs. Eight home runs. Five of them were in the area like by me, just all over the place, right? And we still lost because it's the Tigers, you know. That was the record. The most home runs in a game that you lost. It was like, the game was like 13 to 12. It was ridiculous. Uh, I remember it to this day. And the thing that was really crazy about it is they just kept leaving Tim Wakefield in this game to throw these knuckleballs over and over and over again. Tim Wakefield, 58 years old, died six months ago. Cancer. This week, his wife... 53 years old, died from cancer. They left behind two kids in their late teens, early 20s. You're going, the biggest problem in life? Forgiveness of sins? A bigger issue than cancer? A bigger issue than poverty, tragedy, pain, sickness, loss. I mean, look how broken this world is. You're you're saying among all of those things, this guy gets dropped down from a young age, can't walk. And Jesus looks at him and goes, son, I know you think this is the issue, but it's deeper than that. You see, the issue is, You have sin that needs to be forgiven. This is so central to the Christian message, right? You have things that aren't 
right. And get this, this is what it means to understand the gospel. That sin, that wrongness in you, that stuff that's just not quite what you want it to be. The Bible says it's falling short of God's glory, falling short of God's interests for your life, and it separates you from him. It segregates you from him. And, and then here's the next thing. It has affected and has infected every single one of us. Every single one of us. Now, now some of us do a really good job convincing ourselves that, like, ah, I don't, I'm pretty good. I don't really do anything. And, like, you know, these other people, they're, they're dishonest, but I'm, like, I'm very honest and upright. Can I help you with this? Um, you ever done this thing where you had to update your cell phone recently? Computer, right? Like, what's it give you before you update? There's this thing you got to scroll through. It's like 98 pages long. They call it terms and conditions. And then at the very bottom, before you can accept, what do you have to click? I've read the terms and conditions. You click on that, you lie. You lie, right? I lie. You didn't read those terms and conditions. Come on, right? And here's the thing, you go, oh man, that's, does that really make a, me a sinner? Is that really the unrighteous deeds that the Lord is talking about here in deep need of forgiveness? No, here's, here's what I'm saying though. If right here today we said, listen, for the rest of this morning, we're going to, to each and every one of us, have us stand up and confess the deepest, darkest, worst secret in your entire life. We wouldn't have a chair problem anymore. <laughs> right? right? That, I mean, the reality is, I don't know the darkest hole in your heart, the, the deepest and most sinful thing in your life, but you do. And here's the thing. I know what's in here. And I know it's not good. And so Jesus looks at this man and he goes, Son, your sins are forgiven. Your biggest problem is solved because you're right here with faith in me. Forgiveness has come to you. Now, here's, here's the second thing about this that makes this so art outrageous. Watch what happens in the upcoming verses. Verse 6, it says, but some of the scribes, now the scribes were like the religious leaders of that day. It says, some of the scribes, we're sitting there, and they're reasoning in their hearts. So they're not blurting this out aloud. They're just thinking suspect. They go, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Now here's, here's what Jesus is doing in this interaction. He's going to demonstrate his authority. You see, the religious leaders of the day are actually right on their reasoning in this. They're just wrong on their identity of Jesus. You see, the reasoning is... Listen, this man's sin is a sin against God. Who can forgive that other than God? Right? Like, let, me, let me help you with this. Let's say Gary here has, has a disagreement with Joel about hair care products. Okay? <laughs> So, somebody took the last of the perp plus, I don't know. And let's say this disagreement gets heated. It's so heated that Gary strikes Joel. Real like Michigan basketball coach kind of way. Yeah. Runs off. And then afterwards, I come up and see the two of them and go, Gary, I forgive you. It's all better. Who's left out of this whole equation? The one who actually got hit. 
How am I allowed to forgive you for a sin committed against him? Right? This is the problem that the scribes have. They go, wait a second, wait a second. He can't forgive sins that don't offend him. He's forgiving sins on behalf of God. He's saying, you have sinned against God and you are forgiven. And so the scribes are angry. They go, in fact, so angry, they say, this is blasphemy. That means this is sinning against the Lord. This is attributing himself to God. Now, here's what's so amazing about this. They're right. They just don't realize it. What makes it even better is they don't realize it when Jesus goes, I know what you're thinking. Right? They, in all of this, what they totally miss is him reading their mind and going, hey, what do you think's harder? Do you know another way to ask that? What's the bigger problem? What's the bigger problem in front of you? Your circumstances, the issues in your life? Or is it this? That deep down, you know that there are things about you that just aren't right. There are things about you that you have done that you wish you wouldn't have, said you wish you wouldn't have, thought you wish you wouldn't have, and they have separated you from the harmony and the relationship with God that you were designed to have. Jesus goes, that's a bigger issue. In fact, I'll show you how much bigger of an issue it is. So that, this is verse 10, you may know that the Son of Man, that's Jesus' way of identifying himself, we'll talk about that in the weeks to come, has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out of the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Jesus has the authority to forgive your sins because he's the son of God and he's the son of man. He is the one who God sent to accomplish this task. He's God in the flesh. He's not blaspheming. He's claiming who he really is. Jesus is God. Jesus delivers us from the penalty of sin. That's The church word for that is justification. This is what it means, that when we place our faith in Jesus, that his death on a cross has paid the penalty for our sin. It made us justified or in legal right standing before God. It took that separation that you and I had from God in our sinfulness and his holiness, and it reconciled them. It brought them back together so that you were in harmony with him. He has uh, not only justified us, but the church word is he's sanctified us. That means he's overcome the power of sin in your life. When you become a Christian, when you have placed your faith in him, it says the Holy Spirit comes in us and begins to move us more and more into his presence, more and more into his image, and more and more in our lives, sin no longer has a hold on us, but you have the ability to overcome sin, not by your own working, but by his working in your life. And then finally, and most completely, and the thing that we look forward to is the church word. It's called glorification. It means that Jesus will one day pull you from the very presence of sin and into his presence where there'll be no more tears, no more sin, no more pain, no more brokenness forever and ever. That's what his authority was all about. That's what our biggest problem is and only solution. And so here's here's how we're going to finish today. We're going to pray, and then we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And for those of you, I'm I'm sure you are wondering, like, how the heck are we going to do that with these new aisles and tables and chairs and all of this stuff? We said, we'll figure it out. And let me just add this. One of you is going to be the first one to spill juice on this brand new carpet. It's okay, your sins are forgiven, (laughs) right? Like, you get it? So let's let's pray, and then I'm going to have our guys come up, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. Heavenly Father, a lot of problems in this room. A lot of problems in this town, in this county, in this world. Full of them. 
In fact, we get so focused on them, it's hard to think about anything else. But I'm so thankful as we dig down deep, we recognize that the root of all of them, beneath all of them, is this one problem, this sin and brokenness in us all. And in that, the good news, the good news is you didn't leave us with that. You didn't say tough luck. But you demonstrated your love for us. You demonstrated your grace and mercy in such that you sent your son down to earth to live, to walk through all of that brokenness to witness and experience all that sin around him and directed at him despite not having any of his own. And then you put him on a cross so that he might take that penalty for each and every one of us and place it on himself to deliver us. His body given for us. His blood as a new covenant for each and every one of us. I pray that as we take the Lord's Supper in a moment, that we would remember His death and the power it gives us, the forgiveness it brings us, the remembrance that He conquered sin for us so that we might be made right and be made new. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.